It's right at 11 o'clock and we can see people just streaming through the virtual doorway here. So we wanna welcome all of you who have taken time out today to be with us. Our topic this morning is work ethic, the building blocks of the 21st century workforce. Our presenter today will be Josh Davies, who is the CEO for the Center for Work Ethic Development. Next chart, please. As you are aware, this event was supposed to take place live in Savannah this week. However, with COVID-19 pandemic, we know that the best thing to do was to host this virtually. We want to thank all of the sponsors that you see on the screen here for staying with us when we made the decision from going live in person to virtual because they believe in what SETI is about and wanted to continue their great support. So just take note here of the sponsors and, and who has been a part of making this a virtual reality for you this week. This week we have had a tremendous outpouring already in, uh, in the first three days of the conference. We have had over 3,700 individual registrations across the conference week. And we have had over 1,100 people actually in the conferences that they signed up for. Realize that a lot of people get hey you at the last minute and may not be able to attend, but that's why we're recording this. Next chart. Just some simple housekeeping rules. As I said before, this session and all sessions are being recorded, so that recording and the links to the PDFs of all presentations and the recordings will be available to every registrant, whether you actually signed on at the time of the event or not. If you registered, you will get this information sent to you at the end of the week. Attendees will automatically be muted when joining. Please use the Q&A box. If you, if you move your mouse, you'll see a Q&A box located on the lower navigation bar for all your questions. This is where I'll look to see your questions and I'll discuss those and hand those over to Josh at the end of the session for him to answer. If we have any unanswered questions, we'll still get responses to all those from Josh and we'll send those out with the recording and the PDF file of his presentation. We'd like you also to help in our social media blast by posting this in social media using our hashtag, hashtag SETI2020. We'd also ask you to take time out to consider joining the SETI alumni group on LinkedIn. So long after this virtual event has ended, you still have a place to go to collaborate, share lessons learned and, and ideas for what's going on in, in business and education industries to help one another out through these challenging educational times. Next chart. Uh, real quick, Kevin, if you do uh, use the hashtag SETI2020 and you want to tag me, I am at results driver. And that way you can get the right Josh Davies. Speaking of Josh Davies. Look at that. He looks just like the guy on the screen. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Josh Davies, who currently serves as the chief executive officer for the Center for Work Ethic Development. If you can't figure it out, you will certainly learn very soon here that Josh is passionate about helping others make a difference in their lives, their jobs, and in their community. Through his work as a speaker and a trainer, Josh has engaged and encouraged professionals across North America, the Middle East, and Asia. His engaging and connecting speaking styles combined with relevant content make him an in-demand speaker, and I think you're gonna really enjoy his presentation today. He has been a keynote speaker over 75 instances in presentations and workshops to educators, workforce leaders, and community leaders annually. It is my professional pleasure to welcome today, Josh Davies. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate that. And I'm excited to be here. And I'm excited that you have all taken the time to virtually be here with me as well. 
Um, we've got a lot of great things to talk about today, but I want to get started just quickly introducing my organization. Since Kevin told you a little bit about who I am, the next question probably most of you are asking is, well, what the heck is the center? Well, the Center for Work Ethic Development is an organization we're based in Denver, Colorado. We partner with organizations, more than 750 of them across all 50 states, uh, six foreign countries, helping people get and keep employment because we truly believe in the power of work and that it provides not only self-sufficiency, but also self-worth in a way that you can't get it anywhere else. And so we want to help people not just get work, but keep work. And so we do a lot of research and have become a clearinghouse for research around the idea of workplace soft skills, work ethic, and the whole notion of what it takes not just to get a job, but to keep a job. With that in mind, one of the things we first started looking at was what is it that drives an employer to hire a particular candidate? What are the particular skills that they need that are more in demand than anything else? So as we were going through some research, one of the things we noticed was a great research project from a group called Express Employment. Now you may be familiar with Express Employment. They're a staffing and hiring agency. What's great about Express Employment is that not only do they have thousands of people that they work with across the country, they did 1,500 they surveyed for every single survey, but also they hire people in all sorts of different professions at all sorts of levels in an organization. So you get a real depth and breadth of experience and knowledge. They asked those 1,500 hiring managers four years in a row the same question. When you are hiring somebody for a brand new job, what is the most important skill or attribute that you make when making that hiring decision? And it gave them a list of different options to choose from, and they ranked them from one being the most important all the way down to the least important. Now, what's interesting about this study is they did it four years in a row, so you can really see how attitudes change. And you'll notice that the answers went up and down really kind of throughout the four years, depending on what were the buzzwords, with two exceptions. The most important skill or attribute never changed. Interestingly enough, the least important skill or attribute when making a hiring decision also didn't change. On the screen here, you'll see six of the choices they were given every single year. Attitude education, specific skills, job experience, work ethic, and work history. One of these is what employers told us for four years in a row was the most important skill or attribute. And one of them is what employers said was the least important. What I want you to do right now, wherever you are, you can write this down, you can think in your head, you can type it if you're taking notes, but think, what do you think employers said was the most important skill or attribute, and which one do you think was the least important? Just take a moment to think about it. Okay, that's all the time we have. We've got a lot of other stuff to get to. Let's talk about it, right? All of these things you can look at and make some different cases, right? Specific skills we hear all the time. Hey, you can teach that. It's no big deal. But what's interesting, what I found was really very, very intriguing was the least answer for four years in a row. It was education. Wow, I'm talking to a group of educators here, right? Education was seen as the least important why was that? Well, what employers are telling us is that an education has become really kind of a price of entry. It's not that it isn't important. You have to have it. But where you got your degree, what your GPA was, those kind of things are less and less important. It really is just a key to get you in the door. But it's not going to be making a decision about whether or not you get hired over someone else. What they said, interestingly enough, for four years in a row was the most important hiring decision, work ethic. Interesting. Four years in a row, they said that a person's work ethic was the most important factor. That's really critical to know as we look at helping people get the skills they need to get jobs. But that's about today. What we have learned in 2020 is that change is happening fast, right? We don't know what the future has in store, but we do know things are going to be very different. It's estimated that 80% of the jobs we'll be doing in the next 10 years by 2030 haven't even been invented yet. Now, if you think that's crazy, here's what I'll tell you. A study came out just two weeks ago that looked at the job growth post Great Recession of 2007 and 2008. And what it found is that 70% of the jobs that were created post Great Recession were jobs that didn't exist prior to the Great Recession, right? This job transformation happens in times of change and upheaval, and we're going to see it more than ever. Why is that important? Well, because we don't know what the jobs of the future are going to have in store. But what futurists have looked at is not knowing what the specific jobs are, what are the skills necessary 
and they put together a top 10 list. And the number one item on that list is work ethic. Work ethic is the single most important skill or attribute for an employer hiring today. And it's the number one most important skill for the future. So obviously it's something that we want to focus on to help develop the job seekers, the performers, the employers of tomorrow. So with that in mind, let's get started with a little work ethic 101, if you will. Just a little introduction to this concept. The first and most important thing to know about work ethic is this. What do you mean by work ethic, right? I'm going to bet if I went out there and asked all of you for your definition of work ethic, we'd have more than 150, 200 different definitions of the word work ethic. If you read newspaper articles about work ethic, you'd hear over and over again, it's about athletes. You see this all the time. Athletes who are putting in extra practice time and getting in and doing all that. That's very interesting. But when you ask employers, here's what they'll tell you. Work ethic isn't just the amount of time that you spend at the office or in the work. Because I bet you all know this, right? You've all probably worked with somebody in your life who's the first person there every day and the last person to leave and the least productive person during that time, right? They're there just to make FaceTime, to go talk to people, but they're not productive. What employers tell us is that work ethic isn't about just being there. Now, being on time is important, but it's also about being ready to work being willing to listen and follow instructions, being willing to learn, performing quality work versus just the bare minimum, displaying a positive can-do attitude and completing your work in a timely fashion, getting along with other people, right? It's not one thing. In fact, the research that we did around employers, we then compared with research from the Department of Labor. They did over 250 different career competency models and identified the same seven skills that are necessary for every single job. What we did is we alliterated them so they were easier to remember. The seven skills we identified are that people need to have a positive attitude. They need to have a good attendance, right? They have to be on time all the time. They have to have good appearance, not just in what they wear, but how they hold themselves and how they communicate. They have to have ambition to do more than the bare minimum. They have to be accepting of other people and the rules. They also have to have appreciation for the people they work with and the people they serve. And then to top it all off, the accountability to do what they say they're going to do every single day. Again, they all start with the letter A, makes them easy to remember, and it makes ease, us easy to help remind people because we just tell people that they need to bring their A game every day. Work ethic isn't one thing. It's a set of seven foundational workplace skills, and that's important to keep in mind. Now, here's another thing we need to know about work ethic. What is it with kids these days, right? We can look at it. Kids, the millennials in particular, right? What, do we, what is it with this generation, right? You see all the articles that have been written about them, right? The me, me, me generation. I'll zoom in here a little bit here for you. What are they? Lazy, entitled narcissists who still live with their parents, right? You've seen all this stuff, right? Millennials are ruining everything about life, right? They're ruining cars and marriage and avocado toast, right? There's nothing that millennials can't ruin. Well, at least that's what you read about in all the clickbait articles. If you start to do some research, you notice some interesting trends emerging as it relates to young people in the workplace. Well, we say things very consistently about young people entering in the workplace. We say things like they're privileged, they're narcissistic, they're entitled, they're spoiled. But what's interesting is we say that about young people going into the workforce regardless of when. Because this is actually not a quote from that Time magazine. This is a quote from Life magazine in 1968 that was talking about the generation gap, the hippies coming into the office. Of course, we call them baby boomers now. But we said the same thing about that generation. Right? We say somehow this generation is different right? because of this technology. Right? The cutting edge communications technology makes them even more self-centered and narcissistic. Well, at least that's what we thought in 1985. When the camcorder came out and Gen X was seen as the video generation that had to record everything. Right? What's funny is we think that every generation is different either because they have new technology or there's something different about the world. The reality is we look at the next generation coming into the workplace and always think that they're lazy and that they don't know what they're doing. That's no different. If you really want to look at the numbers though and tell a different story. In fact, the Journal of Business and Psychology did a meta study, a study of studies took 77 different studies around work ethic by generation, averaged out their scores. And what they found is that there was no statistically significant difference between the work ethic scores of any one of the three main generations. 
Wow, look at that. Also, I do want to take this very, very proud moment. As a member of Generation X, the forgotten generation in all this conversation, the generation that people just forget about because we're just not that big, never important enough, who's finally number one? That's right, that's us. We have the best work ethic. Uh, okay, before I start patting myself on the back too much, it's like 0 .03 points. It's a rounding error, right? Basically, it's all the same. What is interesting, though, is attitudes about younger people in the workplace and how quickly they get established. Because those of you who are not doing generational research, you may not know this. We talk about millennials being young and young and young. Here's the reality. The generational cohort known as millennials, the oldest millennials are now nearly 40. The youngest of that generation are in their early mid-20s. That means the youngest people right now that we're serving, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16-year-olds, they're part of a new generation, a generation dubbed Generation Z. I don't come up with these things. I just report them. Now, the reason why that's important is because there are enough Generation Z members in the workplace now for people to get an impression about them. And a study came out asking millennials their opinion about these new upstarts in the office and what they thought about Generation Z. What do you suppose was the number one word that millennials used to describe Generation Z in the workplace? Yeah, lazy. That's right. The same generation that has been derided as narcissistic and lazy looks at the next generation coming in and go, oh, no. They're the lazy ones, right? The reality is the problems with work ethic are not generational. What we see in our research is truly, they are more than anything else, quite honestly, societal. I mean, I say this too, not just talking about Gen Z. We partner with organizations who do CSET programs, senior, senior citizen employment programs, helping 50 and 60 year olds get employment. They teach the same work ethic skills because they know that no matter what generation you're in, no matter how old you are, these are the skills that will make you successful. Well, I guess that leads to a very important question then about work ethic. Can you teach adults work ethic? Well, I think that's a really important question to ask, right? But the answer is very simple. It's an emphatic yes. Yes, you can teach adults work ethic. Right? Not just five and six in the year olds, but you can teach adults work ethic, but you can't do it in a way that we use to teach younger children. But we try all the time. What do we do? We point fingers at people and tell them what not to do or, or give them penalties, right? If you show up late again tomorrow, you're going to get fired. You have to put your phone away in the back room. You're not wearing that to work today. You go home and change, right? We threaten people. We point fingers at them. Well, that may get them to do short-term shifts. But what's that person going to do with the phone when you turn your back or you leave the room? Yeah, it's not going to stay in their pocket, right? If we want to create lasting behavioral change, we can't threaten people. If we want to truly develop work ethic, we have to instead focus on the concept of WIIFN. Not a radio station, not a new concept. Something that we really endorse, though. It stands for what's in it for me. We have to shift the paradigm. We have to get it so that our focus is on why work ethic is important to them instead of why work ethic is important to us as a boss or an employer. When people care about themselves, that's when they change their behavior. We have to change the way we think about teaching work ethic and flip it on its head in order to get results that we want in adults. So with all that being said, the question is this, how did we get here? Why do we even have to teach this stuff, right? It seems like common sense, right? When did we have to tell somebody that eight o'clock means eight and not eight-ish, right? How did we get here? Well, what we found through our research is the reason we're here are the societal pillars that have been developing work ethic over the last 10, 20, 30, and 40 years have been slowly eroding, going away. And so we're not teaching these foundational skills the way we used to. For most of us, We'd say probably the place if you were asked yourself, where did you develop your work ethic, your workplace skills? It was probably not at work. It was probably at home, right? When you think about it, growing up, all the stuff you did at home, working with your parents, having to do things around the house, clean dishes, whatever, right? even just having conversations. Here's one of the problems, though. What we find more and more in families and households are what we call the Twitterization of conversation. That's right. More and more people are on their smartphones, texting their kids, sending messages, Instagram, right, Snapchat. We're spending less and less time in face-to-face -face dialogue. Interesting study came out. I ask you this question. How many hours per week do you think a typical parent 
spends in meaningful dialogue with their school age children. All right. Just think about that. How many hours a week do you think a typical parent spends in meaningful dialogue with their school age children? Well, the scary part is it's 15, but 15 minutes a week. My God, that's less than three minutes a day, right? This is scary, right? We're just not spending time in real dialogue with our kids anymore. Now, for me, one of the problems I have with this is, hey, I don't know if that number is going up or down. It's not trending. It's at one point in time. But also, there's no research that shows that this has an impact on the development of those workplace skills. So we had to keep doing some more research to see what was happening. And fortunately, the University of Minnesota did a 25-year research project looking at young children and then figuring out what their inputs were, tracking them for 25 years to see which ones were most successful later in life. What they found, the most important factor for later success was not education, was not parents' income, was not zip code, was not race. It was doing regular chores at home. Interesting. Well, we took that data point and tried to find some more research around chores. Well, Braun researched a study in 2014 asking parents just two simple questions. Question number one, did you have to do regular chores when you were growing up? Well, not too surprisingly, most of you probably in the room did, right? 82% of us had to do chores when we were growing up. Those same parents were then asked, do you make your children do regular chores at home today? A staggering 28% only said yes. That is a fundamental shift in a single generation of parenting, right? We're talking almost everyone to just a little over a quarter, right? And again, what the study found was that it was the best indicator of future interpersonal and workplace success. Wow. Well, if parents aren't teaching these skills at home, who does the responsibility then fall on to develop these skills? Well, education and secondary education in particular, right? Where we get to spend time developing the school students of the future and really focus on getting them ready for success in life. Well, at least that's what we'd like to be doing. The reality is, and I'm not gonna get political here, but I will just say this. We have been in the shadow of the No Child Left Behind Act for about the last 20 years. And what that's meant to secondary education is a focus around high stakes testing. Because testing determines whether or not your school stays open, whether or not you keep your job, whether or not you get raises, right? All these different factors. And so we spend so much time preparing people to take tests. And the number of tests is staggering. When you look on average across the country, a typical high school senior, by the time they graduate, will have taken almost 100 standardized tests. Your sophomore year, on average, you're taking 10 and a half high stakes tests. The scary part for me is on the far left-hand side, though, of this chart, where in preschool, preschoolers are taking four high stakes tests on average every single year. Wow, this is a lot of testing and a lot of time and emphasis that has to be placed on it. At the same time we're doing all this testing, we're confronting a new reality. Now this is a, a chart and I know it seems a little confusing, but this is all 50 states in the United States over the last seven years that we have data for with how much they're spending per pupil on spending for secondary education. What you notice is the vast majority of states are all in the red. And you can see that many of them have double digit drops led by our friends in Oklahoma, unfortunately, that lost almost 23% per pupil over that last seven year span. On the other side, when you look at the states in blue, even the ones that have gone up are single digits with the exception of our good friends in North Dakota. And I'll tell you this, um, North Dakota is not there because there are only eight kids in North Dakota. There are more than eight kids in North Dakota. North Dakota, during that time, happened to discover oil and gas across Western North Dakota, which fundamentally shifted their funding mechanism. Now, I don't have a crystal ball either, but here's what I'm going to tell you. One of the impacts of 2020 and the COVID epidemic right, is going to be a decline in state and local budgets. Massive, massive cuts are going to happen. And unfortunately, I think what's going to happen is we're going to see this really impacting secondary education and post-secondary education and the support it receives. And so these numbers are only going to go down. Why do I point that out? Because what this means is we have fewer resources to teach our kids and more emphasis on testing. Well, so something has to give. So what types of classes get offered less and less in American secondary education? 
Well, I can tell you, it's not things that are on the test, right? It's not reading, writing, science, math. No, it's also not even things like fine arts and foreign languages. When you look nationwide, the only type of class that's seen a significant decline over the last 20 years has been career and technical education programs. Right? The CTE programs where we're developing the work-based learning to develop these skills. Right? You may never go into the culinary arts or go into you know, auto tech, but taking those classes is teaching you those lessons. Right? CTE classes are so valuable and they're being offered less and less in American high schools. So if we're not developing skills at home, we're not developing them at school, where do we develop them? Well, for many of us, the place that we next developed them was on the job, right? Think about your first job, right? It probably wasn't something that was very glamorous, right? I mean, probably the most glamorous job you had growing up was like a lifeguard, right? That was pretty awesome, right? Many of us got our start in food service or some sort of ag job wherever we were, right? Regardless, your first job is not necessarily teaching you the technical skills you need to be successful. It's helping you learn these workplace soft skills, right? The work ethic, right? Things like showing up on time, getting along with people you don't like, having to deal with a bad boss, right? Those kinds of things are so valuable. But the problem is young people aren't working anymore to develop them. Interestingly enough, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has been tracking youth employment, 16 and 19 year olds since 1948. What you can see there is it's a pretty consistent range around 50 to 60% of 16 and 19 year olds are engaged in the labor market. That trend continued until we reached 2001 in the dot-com bust. And what you start to see is that number starts to go down. It gets exacerbated by the Great Recession of 2007, 2008, and now is at all-time lows at around 35%, almost half of where it used to be. Scarier yet, the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimated that by 2024, it would be down to 25%. I'm going to tell you, those projections were made pre-COVID. If we were at 14, 12% unemployment, I can assure you that youth numbers are gonna be even lower because they're gonna be the ones most quickly displaced from the labor market. Now this is for teens working part-time or full-time jobs while they're, you know, during the school year. What about summer jobs though? Summer jobs are different. Well, yeah, they were different, but they're seeing the same trend. We peaked in the late 70s at about 75% of young people who had summer jobs. That number has been declining ever since. And now we're at less than 45%. Wow, young people just aren't working anymore. They're not developing these skills. So why aren't young people working? What are the barriers? What are, what are we doing to keep young people, right? Is it that the minimum wage is too high? Is it that the labor laws keep them from doing things? Why, why are young people not working? What can we do? Well, Challenger Gray and Christmas analyzed the Bureau of Labor Statistics data to try and figure out why so many young people weren't in the labor force. What they did is they analyzed it since 1994, and what you'll notice is that blue line there shows the number of young people who are disengaged from the labor force, nearly doubling to almost 1.2 million by 2014. What I found interesting about their data, though, is that red line at the bottom. That red line there is the number of young people who are looking for work and can't find it. What do you notice? That line doesn't change, and it's really low. The reason why that blue line goes up, 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 and up is it perfectly mirrors that yellowish green line right below it. And who are those? Those are young people who don't want a job and no one's making them. The reality is that we're seeing fewer and fewer parents push pe young people into getting work. Maybe it's too challenging. It's too difficult. They don't have transportation. Maybe they want academics to be their job. Maybe they're just overscheduled. I heard people say, too, you only get to be a kid once. But the reality is, for whatever reason, young people haven't been working not because they couldn't get work, but because they didn't want to. The problem here, again, post-COVID, is that we're going to find that young people are both not going to be able to get work or not want to. And so those numbers are just going to go higher and higher. Huh. Well, <laughs> if we're not teaching at home, school, or working, where do you learn these workplace skills? Well, oftentimes, we found these skills were reinforced through pop culture and mass media. And we spent a lot of time, maybe you haven't seen this billboard lately on the streets where you live, because the US government stopped spending money on this in the 20s, right? But the reality is what we see today in mass media and pop culture is not this idea that well done is better than well said, right? Work hard. It's about get rich quick. 
It's about getting discovered. It's about going viral on YouTube, right? What do you have to do? You have to do something crazy and do it over and over again, right? It's a get rich quick environment. It's win the lottery, right? The most popular types of TV ads you see promoted on daytime TV, miracle pills that will solve all of your problems and injury lawyers will get you millions of dollars just for getting T-boned by a semi, right? Most popular TV show on TV are reality TV shows. What workplace skills do you need? You, you don't need any skills in order to work on reality TV, right? Maybe create drama, right? That's it. And no employer is really looking for that skill. Right? The reality is that work in pop culture and mass media is seen really as more of a stigma than something to be celebrated. And that's no one's fault. It's just the reality of where we are. And so we're not teaching these skills there either. I think while this sign may have been emblematic of America and another generation, another sign that I saw the last uh, a little while ago, I think, really incorporates kind of where we are now and our attitude about work. It's about giving 100% at work, and that is so true. You just divvy it up throughout the week. I'm, I'm just glad that I have the Thursday slot and that we decided not to do the conference into Friday because I don't even know who many would show up for that. But the reality is the reason why we have to develop workplace skills today is that common sense is not common practice because the places we've been developing this have been going away for almost four decades in some cases. So with that in mind, let's then now take a look and get a sense now what the impact is of all of this. Well, the impact of this work ethic gap is felt in a lot of different ways. And we think about work as a number one place for it, but the reality is what we find is that actually it starts before that. Work ethic plays a critical role in academic success as well. When you look at it, and this is really a no-brainer for us in education, right? We know this. Students who are in the top quartile of non-cognitive skills, right, of these basic work ethic behaviors, graduate from high school at nearly 100% of the time and have graduation rates from post-secondary at nearly four times the rate of their less ranked counterparts, right? We know that, right? People who have strong work ethic will succeed more academically. That just makes sense. But what's also important to know is that people with work ethic are in high demand because when it comes to the workplace, three quarters of employers say that the incoming workforce, no matter if that's coming straight out of secondary or post-secondary programs, whether or not that's at a two-year or four-year military job training, they're unprepared for work and lack adequate work ethic. Right? Employers talk about a skills gap all the time, that there's skills gaps. I can't find skills, skills, skills. But when asked, what skills do you need us to get? Right? Do we need more computer skills? Right? Do we need more tech literacy? Do we need more certificate programs? Do we need more CNAs? What do we need? The vast majority, 44%, say that the thing they need more than anything else are just basic soft skills. They just can't find people with the basics. Right? As I travel around the country, I talk with employers. Employers tell me almost the same thing. Right? If you could just hire, send, send me somebody who will show up every day, get along with their coworkers, and follow basic instructions, I will hire anyone you send me. And sure, maybe that's true during historically low unemployment. But what you find is when the pendulum swings and we're now having to develop a workforce for the future, that soft skills will still differentiate and separate great candidates from mediocre ones. That soft skills, I would tell you, are gonna be even more important for our employer employees to have, for our students to develop, to become successful workers. In fact, one of the interesting things you'll look at when talking to hiring managers is that really the, the, the trend has shifted. It used to be that soft skills were nice to have. Now, 93% of hiring managers say that soft skills are as important, if not more important, than developing hard skills in an interview process. All right, we'll teach you the technical skills, the hard skills, as long as you have the base knowledge, but the soft skills are more important than ever. What that means though, on the flip side of that, is it says here, 7% of managers think that technical skills are more important than soft skills. Like I'd hire somebody with great technical skills, even if they're a jerk, because they're gonna do good work. Well, I'm not saying that that 7% of hiring managers, I'm not saying they're dumb. I'm just saying 7% of people can be wrong on a lot of things. In fact, 7% of Americans also believe that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. Okay. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert for those of you who are questioning that. No, no, it does not. Okay. Chocolate milk does not come from brown cows. 
right? The reality is soft skills are more and more important than they ever have been. In an era of high tech, high touch becomes even more valuable. In fact, when managers were asked, what made somebody a bad hire? It wasn't that they didn't have the technical skills. 92% of the time, it was that they lacked basic soft skills. That's why the person was a bad hire to begin with. And it makes sense, right? When you think about it, right? Let's just say this, for instance, like right? you've got somebody who works for you who's not very good at their job, okay? They're not terrible, but they're just uh, a little below average. But if they are a below average performer who gets along with everybody, makes people smile, and pitches in to help out when asked, how long can that below average employee keep a job? Forever, right? <laughs> The reality is we'll keep people with good soft skills, even if their technical skills aren't great. That's how valuable they are in the office, right? When you look at why people get fired from their jobs, and Forbes magazine did a study with 20,000 newly hired employees, found that 46% of them got fired within a year and a half after getting their job. The reason why they got fired wasn't because they didn't have the technical skills. 89% of the time, it was because of their lack of attitude, work ethic, and soft skills, right? We hire for aptitude, but fire for attitude. And this isn't a new concept. Over a hundred years ago, Harvard University did a study. It's recently been redone by the Carnegie Institution and by Stanford Research. And they found this, that 85% of your success in this world comes from having well-developed soft skills and people skills. Now, that's not to say that technical skills and knowledge, those hard skills aren't important. Right? If you look at that pyramid, that blue part of the top is critical because that's what's going to get your foot in the door. Right? Without that certification, without that degree, you're not even going to get considered for a job. But without the red, you're not going to keep that job. And that's what's important. Right? It's not an either or technical, you know, hard skill, soft skill. It's an and. We have to be as intentional about developing the two of them together as we can. If we're going to prepare people for the 21st century workforce, if we're going to get them prepared to be successful in this post-COVID era, we've got to focus and be as intentional on those soft skills as we are on the technical skills in our programs. So with that in mind, let me give you some strategies, some things that you can do that you can incorporate in order to develop work ethic in your students. Now, I'm going to tell you this. There are a lot of different soft skills training programs out there. You may be using some of them. You may have created your own curriculum. You may have a workforce readiness program, whatever. We have our own curriculum too. I, I don't care. These skills are so important. I don't care what you're doing, but you have to do something. And I'm going to give you some tips that you can use no matter what curriculum you're using. Even if you don't have any at all, these are simple things that you can do every single day. All right. So let's start with number one. First thing we have to do is create awareness. Right. Here's the problem. When it comes to work ethic, so many people don't know what they don't know. Think about this. Think about the laziest person that you know out there, right? The laziest person sitting on the couch all day long, right? For some of you, this may be easy. It may be your child who's still at your house right now, right? Whatever it is, right? Think about that person. And imagine asking them that, this question. Hey, lazy person, how's your work ethic? What do you think they're going to tell you? Oh, it's terrible. No, they're going to tell you, man, it's pretty good, right? They, just, they have no idea whatsoever. And this is true for almost everybody in the workplace. Now, it's especially true for people who don't have a lot of experience in the workplace, younger workers in particular, because they haven't been exposed, right? We already said that. It's not going to get home. It's not at school. They're not working early on. So they just don't know what they don't know. So it should be no surprise that this study came out with 6,000 younger millennial workers. Now, I, I spent a lot of time telling you this before. It's not about one particular generation, but younger workers in general just don't have the experiences. So... I bring this up. This group was asked, would any of these words describe you at work? Would you say you're people savvy, tech savvy, loyal to your employer, fun loving, or hardworking? The percentage that said yes, this described them at work is very interesting. The number one response, hardworking. 86% of millennials said they're hardworking. 82% described themselves as loyal to their employer. The one that ranked least fun loving, right? This is just a nose to the grindstone, work till it gets done. I don't care. Weekends, evenings, right? Well, at least that's their perception. And the reason I bring that up is because what's great about this study is that not only does it have millennials describe themselves 
and then took those same 6,000 people and had those millennials bosses describe them. Their responses are, how we say, slightly different. <laughs> what I love, tech savvy, way up, right? The millennials didn't realize quite how tech savvy they are. Loyal, 1%. Hardworking, 11 right? There's a disconnect here between these two. And part of that is a lack of awareness, but part of it is this. We oftentimes don't see what other people see when it comes to our work ethic, right? When we look in the mirror, we may see a very different image than what we think we see, right? Why? Because when it comes to work ethic, it's just like everything else in this world, right? We judge ourselves based on our intentions, but others judge us based on our actions, we didn't mean to be lazy. We didn't mean to be disrespectful. We just didn't know, right? The most important thing we can do to help develop work ethic in our students is to help them realize what the expectations are, right? Make sure that they know so that they can be aware and they can just stop being blissfully ignorant, right? Um, I kind of refer to it as the karaoke effect, right? You sing in the shower, you sing in the car, you get two beers in, you get up on stage. Not a good combination, right? You don't realize how bad you are at singing because you've never had to hear other people tell you how you are, right? We need to help them out. And that's where our role comes in to help make sure that they can be aware of what the expectations can be. Um, let me put it this way. Um, it, it said that you should oftentimes quote famous people. Um, so I'm going to quote an American poet. Because I think his point on creating awareness around work ethic is so powerful. It resonates today as it did when, it, when he first wrote it. Um, I'm not sure you're aware of the famous American poet um, by the name of Ice Cube. But he said this. He said, quote, you had better checkity check yourself before you wreckity wreck yourself. Mm. Amen, Cube. Amen. I think that says everything perfectly. All right, now let's move on to the next one. Once we've created awareness, what do we have to do? We have to allow for discovery. One of the things that's critical about work ethic and that focus on what's in it for me, right? That whiff we talked about before is this. If you force facts and figures on people, they tend to get defensive, right? We step back. We're like, you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me why this is important. But when you allow people to discover facts on their own, they own them. Right? People don't argue with their own data. When they discover it, they own it. Let me give you a perfect example. Um, growing up, um, I grew up in a fairly poor Midwestern family. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. We did not take expensive trips to Disneyland or the beach or anywhere else. Um, in fact, every single year, we took a family vacation and we went camping for two weeks in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And when I say every year, I mean every year. That's all we did for vacation. Now, uh, I will say this. Um, there was one year that was a different year. I remember my parents told us we were not going to go to the Black Hills that year. We we're going to do something different. And we were all excited. My brother and I, we were you know, like, Disney, Disney, Disney. And they're like, all right, here's what we're going to do this year. We're going to go visit your cousins in Wichita. Yes, uh, it was a road trip to Wichita instead of the Black Hills. Um, now, we initially weren't that excited, but here was the great thing. Um, my cousin had two things. Now, this was in 1984, so this was pretty impressive. He had two things at his house. Number one, he had a below ground, like an in-ground swimming pool. Crazy, right? And number two, they had HBO. I'm going to say, we didn't even have basic cable at the time, right? We had like rabbit ears. Like, this was crazy. We spent the whole two weeks watching movies, swimming in the pool. I remember one of the Friday nights, it was really late because we'd been watching, they did like a, it was like a four pack. It was like Jaws 1, Jaws 2, Jaws 3, and Jaws 4, back to back to back to back. And we watched all four of them. And we're all like hyped up on Mountain Dew. I don't know, it's like two o'clock in the morning. We've been watching shark movies all night. And my cousin says, hey, let's go get in the pool. That was not a good idea, right? If you've ever been in one of those pools at night, right, you get these weird lights and the shadows, and I swear to God, there were sharks in that pool. To this day, sharks scare the bejesus out of me, okay? I hate sharks. In fact, I hate sharks so much when I go to the ocean now, I don't swim in the ocean. I don't surf in the ocean. I don't go any deeper than my knees because those things will kill you. That's at least 
my perception, right? So for those of you who weren't paying attention last summer, there were a boatload of shark attacks. It seemed like every week there were new people getting attacked by sharks up and down the East Coast of the United States. So I started to do some research. And what was interesting to me was a little worldwide data that I, I came across. Looking at the number of sharks deaths, how many people were killed by sharks in 2015, the last year that they had data available. What was interesting, you know how many people died from shark attacks worldwide last year, in that year, 2015? Eight. Eight, that's it. You know what's scary? Selfies. Do you know how many people died taking selfies that same year? 28, okay? That's like a, almost a four to one shark to selfie death ratio, right? More people died taking selfies than almost any other types of these random things that we think about are really deadly, right? The reality is that sharks are not going to kill you. Taking a selfie though might. Right? In fact, it's gotten so bad, the number of selfie deaths around the world continues to go up, 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 and up. So people have to put out signs, right? One of the campaigns in India I thought was great had all of these places that you shouldn't take selfies, which only says two things to me. And number one, A, you know somebody had to die doing each and every one of these things. Um, my, my favorite is the tiger in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, but it almost also, for some people, I think, becomes like a checkoff list, right? Can I take a selfie with all of these different things? Because this is, doesn't always mean don't do it. It's almost like it's a challenge. The reality for me is my experience with a phone happened not because I had one of these signs. I remember it vividly. I was in Washington, D.C. I was walking from a hotel to a conference, and I was walking down the street, and I had my phone out. And um, I was sending a message, um, and I got to a very serious part in the message, so I had to stop and two-thumb it. You know, that part where you actually have to use both your thumbs because the message is that serious. So I stop and I tooth thumb it. And no sooner do I stop than a Metro bus flashes in front of my face. If I hadn't have stopped to double thumb that message, that bus would have taken me out. From that day on, because of that experience, I know to make sure that I'm in control of my cell phone. I don't have it in the car. Even when I'm walking down the street where I think I can't hurt somebody else, I can hurt myself. You have to take experience. But it wasn't because of one of these signs. It was because I discovered it. Because it was my experience. That's what makes a difference. We have to allow our students to uncover things on their own. Because when they do that, they own it. And when they own it, that's when behavior changes. All right. The next thing we really want to focus on is this idea of being the change. And I think it's really good to be getting to this point, right? As we, as we've been through the last several weeks of protests nationwide, but we're reminded of some of the great protest movements across the world. And this is a famous quote, of course, from Gandhi in India, who led one of the most peaceful resistance movements the history of the world has ever seen, right? He said, you have to be the change you want to be. What do I mean by that? Here's one of the most powerful things you can do to develop work ethic skills in your students. Model them. Modeling is so powerful, right? I, here's a great example. You know how difficult it is? Try doing this later today. Go to every single person that you run into, and th this may be harder to do now in our new era of face masks, but smile at strangers and see how many of them smile back at you. It's an instinctive modeling behavior, little things that we can do that'll have a huge impact. Right? If we say that timeliness is important, we need to make sure we start our classes on time. If we say that accountability is important, make sure you do what you say you're going to do and don't come up with excuses for why you didn't get it done. Right? We have to model. Those of you who have been working at home and have kids at home, you know how powerful this is, right? Because probably your kids are modeling all of your behaviors, right? They're picking up on all the things that we do. Our students are no different. Our coworkers are no different. Our faculty and staff are no different. When I look at the organizations that are most successful about developing these workplace skills and their students and the people they serve, it's because the people in the organization live the same skills. You have to be the change. You can't simply talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. All right. Another key step as we think about what to do kind of moving forward and, and how to do this is simply this, building connections. What we have to do is make sure that work ethic and soft skills are seen as as important and contextualized in the experiences of our students. Right? One of the reasons that 
work ethic and soft skills don't take place is because they're seen as something you do somewhere else, right? It's not connected to everything. But how about incorporating them and building those connections into the work that we're doing, right? How does work ethic play its role in your workplace, in the work ethic, in the uh, workplace skills training that you're doing? How do these skills, these soft skills, get layered hand in hand with your technical skills, with the academic skills? Because they do, they fit. And when people see that connection, that's when they start to truly get those aha moments. But the problem is this, we don't oftentimes build those connections. And what's happened in our society is we've actually become focused more on our differences than on our similarities. Right? We're so focused on what's different about this and what's different about that and how there are, right? that we forget that we're 95% or 99% similar to everyone else. What we have to do is focus on the things we have in common rather than the things that we don't. That'll allow us to build connections in our programs. Let's do an example and see how well we can do that same sort of idea of finding things in common with very different elements or groups of people in this case. All right, so let's take three very different groups of people. Person number one, a bank robber. Okay, so somebody who's stealing money from a bank, just generally not good people, right? Bank robbers are not good people. Second group of people, preachers, right? Preachers preaching on the church on Sunday, all right? So a group of preachers. And the third group, very different from them, people just want to have a good time, right? DJs, right? Hey, it's a wedding DJ, right? So we've got DJs, we've got our men and women of the cloth, and we've got bank robbers. I, you could argue these are three very different groups. But when you look closely at it, you actually can find more similarities if you want to. Right? For instance, a bank robber, what do they have in common with a preacher? Well, think about this. What do they both want from us? Money, right? Now, the bank robber wants to steal it to do it for bad. The preacher wants it for good, but they still both want our money, right? So that's one thing they have in common. Well, how about the DJ? What does the DJ have in common with a bank robber? Well, you're like, well, I don't, what, 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 I don't know. But if you think about this, they both have the same objective for people that are in front of them. They need everybody to get to the floor. Now, for the bank robber, of course, that's literally to drop to the floor. And for the DJ, it's to get on the dance floor. But they want to get everybody on the floor. What's the DJs of the world? What do they have in common with the preachers? Well, they're constantly trying to get that back and forth from the crowd. They're going to ask you, are you with me? Right? And what's in common? between a bank robber, a preacher, and a DJ? What, do they have, what, what could those three groups possibly have in common? What do they want all of us to do? No matter whether or not we're robbing a bank, preaching a sermon on Sunday, or getting people on the dance floor, all three of them want us to get our hands in the air. That's right. When you look at it, right, what you find is that three very different groups, bank robbers, preachers, and DJs, can all have something in common. What we have to do is build those links between the workplace soft skills and the academic and technical skills that we're teaching. When people understand the context, it helps them apply the learning, which then leads to that ownership. And that's going to be really important. All right. So the next skill that I want to talk about, the next thing in terms of developing skills is this. It's about the 1% approach. Now, the 1% approach is really important because one of the problems that happens is that when people get awareness, right, when students realize they are not as good as they think, and they look at the gap between where they are and where they need to be, they're thinking that's insurmountable, right? If you've got somebody who's not a runner, and you're going to tell them, hey, I'm going to put you in a 12-week program, and in 12 weeks, you're going to finish a marathon, most of them are going to tell you, no, thank you, right? Because the gap between not running at all and running 26.2 miles seems astronomically crazy, right? They're not even going to start. They're not even going to try. They give up. How do we prevent that from happening? Through small incremental change, or what we say, the 1% approach. Can you be 1% better tomorrow than you are today? For most people, that's a no-brainer, right? Of course I could be 1% better, right? I mean, like, like that's nothing, right? 1% is just, that, that, yeah, of course I could do that. If you've got a student who's habitually 14 minutes late to class, instead of asking them, can you be on time tomorrow? Can you say this? Do you think you can only be 13 minutes late tomorrow? I mean, <laughs> sure, it seems stupid and you're kind of in, feel like you're endorsing them being late. But if you could get them to be one minute 
earlier every day, right? In a couple of weeks, right? They maybe come to class on time, right? Here's the funny part. When you look at small incremental changes over time, it adds up in a hurry. If you just are 1% better every day for 40 days, how much better are you at the end of the 40 days? Well, um, I thought this was a pretty easy math question, right? 1% every day, 40 days. That means you're 40% better at the end of 40 days, right? That's, duh, that's a no-brainer. But here's the funny part. Compound interest, the same thing that makes your credit card bills impossible to pay off, also applies here. And what you find is you're the 1% better of the 1% of the 1%, and you're actually going to be over 120% better at a skill by being just 1% better every day for 40 days. Small incremental changes. They don't have to flip a light switch tomorrow. They don't have to be superhuman all of a sudden, super work ethic. No, 1% better. And sometimes even a 1% change can create a huge impact. Like here's a perfect example. Um, let's take, I don't know, this sentence. Here you have a person with three hobbies, just a normal everyday average American person. They love to cook, they love their kids, they love animals. Right? Just a sweet person, right? Somebody you'd want to invite over for dinner, right? It's good. Just a nice person. What's a 1% change in that person? If you get rid of the commas in the sentence, what happens now? This person now loves cooking their own children and animals, right? <laughs> we move from a well-adjusted person to a cannibal eating their own children, right? That's a 1% change. Huge impact. Small little change. Right? The reality is small wins. It doesn't have to be big and overnight truly helps people. The last tip I want to give you is this. We need to be explicit about what we want. One of the problems with soft skills as opposed to technical skills is that we oftentimes don't do a very good job of clearly defining what the skill is and what it looks like, right? We tell people all the time, hey, I just need you to have a better attitude. Uh, okay, well, what, is, what does that mean, right? How do you know I have a better attitude or don't have a better attitude? It's all so subjective, but and that really becomes a problem for people. Why? Because they don't clearly define what that looks like, right? Because attitude isn't about what you feel inside. It's about this, right? It's about staying positive in every situation and taking control of the way you react, right? How do I know you're not having good attitude today? How do I know your attitude is poor? Because you're letting a bad moment that happened this morning turn into a bad day. Right? You're not taking control of your emotions. You're letting your emotions control you. Instead of looking at the upside of something, you're always looking at the downside. Right? I can clearly define this and then I can observe it in you so that I can help coach it in you. Right? Because when you clearly define, when you are explicit about what the definitions are that you're looking for, when they're observable, when they're measurable, that's when they get to be coachable. That's when you can help your students truly develop these skills, but only when they're explicit in those specific areas. All right. Now, I've talked about a lot of different things. If you're interested in getting some more of our research, um, you can do that at our, work, our website at workethic.org. We also have free work ethic weekly tips you can sign up for. They get delivered to your inbox every Monday. Um, I know a lot of folks put them up on a board or use it for their students throughout the uh, year. There's 52 of them. So you have a whole host of different things. Um, you can come and find the definitions to all seven of our A's in there as well. You can find out more information about our curriculum, all sorts of great things. Lots of resources there to help you as you're developing these skills for the 21st century. Now, before I go any further, let me just remind you probably the most important thing. So everybody out there, what I need you to do is I need you to look at the camera with me, okay? And I need you to put your hand up just like this, okay? Wiggle your fingers for me. Okay, good, good. I hope you're all doing that, all right? Now take your thumb, forefinger, make a little O like this, okay? Now what I'd like you to do with that O, okay, is I'd like you to put that on your chin for me, okay? Now, what I'd like you to do now is just look and see where your hand is. Is your hand on your chin or is your hand on your cheek? Hmm. For most of us, our hand was probably on our cheek. Why? Because you're watching me and what I do, not what I say. If we truly want to develop these skills, the work ethic that we know employers are demanding today and that they're going to be demanding in the future, if we want to set our students up for success, we can't simply talk about these. 
We have to be intentional in developing these skills, just as we are with our technical skills and our academic skills. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Kevin and thank our sponsors again, and then open up to some Q&A. Kevin? Well, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I'm, I'm guilty, Josh, in that uh, the O was on my cheek. <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe he did that to me. He got sorry, me. Kevin. I'm, I'm sorry. No. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank you for a great presentation. And there are, there are a couple of, of what I call life lessons, not just educational lessons, but life lessons that I, that I personally um, can, can, can attest to, okay? Uh, first of all, doing daily chores, okay? True story. Night one, day one, my daughter is in AIT training as a young Air Force person at, at Lackland Air Force Base, day one in training. They're allowed by the one way. phone call to basically tell your parents, I'm, I'm not dead, I'm alive, <laughs> and I'm thinking about you, but I'm not going to call you for another 60 days, okay? Right. Yeah. She says, I love you, Dad. Guess what? I'm the only person in my 38 person flight that knows how to make a bed so they put me in charge of the other 38 true story true story okay once again those daily chores they, they add up but i'll tell you what fast forward to graduation ceremony i bet there were over 20 parents that came to my wife and i and thanked us for <laughs> our daughter helping keep their their daughter on the straight and narrow starting with starting with everybody crying her eyes out on night one at Megan at Megan's bunk rack uh, the other thing I'd say you talked about the one percent one of the things that I used to do for 30 years in another institution called the Army is I'd walk around and I'd ask my people tell me one thing that you have learned today that you're going to pass on to somebody else in our organization. Think about it. What happens in an organization that's just got maybe 100 people? If all 100 learn one new thing a day and they pass it along at the end of a year, that organization will not be mediocre at all. It will be high performing because they're all learning every day from one another. So the 1% making you better, I, I totally abide by that. Um, when we look at questions here, they're starting to come in. Uh, I've got one question. It says, okay, if you had to select the number one soft skill that every worker needs to add to their work ethic kit bag, regardless of their career field, regardless of their age, what do you think that one foundational soft skill ought to be that everybody ought to, ought to put in their rucksack? Well, I'll tell you this. What we have found through our research is the one that is the core, the, that everything else is based on, is having a positive attitude. People who have a positive attitude, who take control of their emotions, set themselves up to be successful in the others. It's really hard to consistently deliver any of the other soft skills if you don't regulate that emotional component. If you don't have that positive attitude, if you don't you know, see things in that way and that you don't take some ownership of it, then the rest of them really are going to fall apart because you just don't consistently, you won't be able to consistently deliver them. So that's what I would say. I think that attitude is the most important. Not that they all aren't, right? Uh, but, you know, we all love our kids a little bit differently. <laughs> right. Next question. Um, we talked about um, talking about about work, okay? Are, are we defining work purely in terms within a capitalist framework, i.e., you know, you, you work for a corporation and they pay you money, okay? But there are young people out there today who are volunteering or working within activist organizations or working in a, in a, in a gig economy that may or may not right? track you by your statistics. Can, can you comment on that, please? I, I would argue that soft skills are even more... I, I don't want to say even more important, are important no matter where you are. Yes, in the sort of traditional capitalist sort of worker, company, they're important there. But these are skills that are going to make a difference for you even outside of work environments, right? When you think about your personal relationships with people, they're significantly impacted by these work ethic skills, right? We define it because it's work ethic because that's the term that people use, but it's not even about work. 
right? It's about these foundational soft skills that help you relate to people. We break them down kind of in two different categories, personal and interpersonal, right? So the personal ones are decisions that you make that really just involve yourself, right? Attendance, appearance, attitude, um, ambition. But then there are the interpersonal ones about how you relate to other people, right? Appreciation, accountability, um, and acceptance, right? And so those skills are going to be critically important, especially in those non-traditional workplaces where you have to really interact more on like a human level than you do kind of in a traditional corporate workplace. Right. Okay. A couple of comments. Great presentation. Here's Thank another you. one. You rock. Here's another one. Great presentation. Uh, thanks, Josh, for being in the house. Here's another one. You rocked. Yes, Welcome. my hand was on my cheek. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Here's a good, here's a good, here's a good question. Okay. Um, how do you feel that the fact that many parents need to work full time and in, in free time, many are focusing on their kids academic skills due to the testing in schools may have impacted their ability to teach work skills to their children. Uh, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, you know, and I, I'm not to, I don't want to in any way, shape, or form imply that parents are at fault. The reality is right, you've only got so much time. You've only got so many resources. It's kind of where do you put that time and where do you put those resources? Um, and like, you know, we talk about academics and these kinds of things. Uh, one of the things that I hear from parents a lot is they have kids in some sort of athletics or other activities, um, dance or these kinds of things. And um, you listen to them talk about the schedules, right? It's not just going to rehearsals and practice, right? They're going to like weekend tournaments every weekend, traveling, driving all over the country, right? I'm not surprised that the kids aren't working. I'm surprised the parents are able to hold jobs, right? There are so much going on. There's so much over scheduling that's happening. It's really hard to devote that time. And I'm not here to say that that's inevitable, but that's the reality of where we are. We just need to know that we're not doing that. But there are little things that we can do, like just having kids do chores that we know do have a big impact at home and can really make a difference in how they become successful in those other things that we have them doing. Right. Some more comments. I love the presentation. I literally laughed out loud more than once. Awesome presentation. <laughs> My you. two boys, ages 14 and 17, watched with me. I think that's cool. Uh, great comments and questions. Uh, here's, a, here's a question here. Do you know if there's any research on the correlation between the decrease in youth employment today and increased numbers in crime in our nation? Um, I'd need to go. I think you'd want to sort of spot check that. I mean, overall, when you look at the crime, I mean, they, I would say there probably isn't a corollary, um, only because when you look nationwide, We've been having declining crime rates across the United States over the last 20 years. And that's the same time we've seen decreases in youth employment. So I'm not necessarily sure that there's a nationwide correlation. There may be in certain sub-markets where mm -hmm. you see, um, you know, very large levels of youth unemployment and disengagement that may lead to more crime. Um, right. But again, what we're finding is that a lot of these youth um, aren't working and are busy doing other things. Um, now that maybe, you know, playing Overwatch on your computer, but they're busy doing other things, not working. They're not well, looking I can tell you one thing. 25% um, of the workforce investment dollars that come down from, from federal monies down to state monies are earmarked these days for at-risk youth. There's a reason for that, okay? The reason for that is that, one, I think the, 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 the leadership out there today realizes that the college dream is not necessarily everybody's dream or their, their, their financial reality that they can get to. Uh, the other reality is, is that, you know, over 60% of the jobs that are open today and will be open tomorrow when everybody comes back to work, don't need a degree on anything, but you better have some type of credential packed with soft skills to be workforce ready when, when, when the gates start opening again. Yeah. Uh, another great comment here. Loaded presentation, Josh. Great presentation, by the way. Awesome. Thank um, you. The 1% works with kiddos as well. Quarantine is helping us to refocus and assess where we are because we're there with our kids. Yeah. Do chores with them. I think that's a great comment. 
Yeah, it's not also like this idea, right? That again, it's the shared piece. When people feel that it's not being done to them, that it's something that we do, it doesn't matter how old you are, it feels better, right? We all want to be part of something, not have something thrust upon us. So that, I love that strategy. Um, and certainly quarantine and where we are today, um, you know, there's some parts of it that are awful, but I think that's also is a reminder to all of us, there are some things that maybe we want to keep doing even after quarantine's over. I, I, I agree. Okay. Um, how can you be effective when you are fighting the laid back slash not caring parent culture the kids experience at home and in their community? The, the key there is that the idea of what's in it for me, right? Why do our student, why does this matter to them? Why should they care about doing these things? What's going to be the benefit to them long-term, short-term? Why are these things going to help them? And helping people understand that is going to be the key to changing things. Like, for instance, when we talk about attendance, one of the things that I think is really important is you start talking about how does it feel to you when people are always late? What does it say when you're the only one who shows up on time and everyone else shows up 20 minutes late? How does that make you feel? Why? And getting people to understand and process these things and asking a lot of those why questions helps people uncover those things and helps them understand the intrinsic motivation for them. Because that's what's going to change people's behaviors, not hopefully getting over some sort of culture piece with parents who, you know, are laissez-faire or let kids be kids or what that might be. When they understand why it matters, they'll make the change. You're, you're right. And, and I will tell you, um, one of the things that, that I do when I interview instructors for our credential courses is I ask them, do you consider yourself being an instructor or do you consider yourself being a mentor trainer coach? Because I, I truly believe in the classroom today, regardless of the ages that are in the classroom, you got to know when to turn that two-sided ball cap from instructor, hey, Josh, pay attention. You're going to see this on Friday in a, in a mental exercise, hence quiz or test, versus, hey, Josh, um, you're not leading the conversation today. You seem like you're, you're way distance. You know, it's like somebody ran over your dog or something. What's going on? The mentor trainer coach in the classroom today not only tells the students the what, but they have the why, and how is that going to be important when they leave that classroom tomorrow with that skill in their rucksack? That is important today because the younger generation doesn't need, just want to know the what. They demand to know the how and the why. Yep. Well, and that's a, that's a perfect example, Kevin, of the research from Harvard, right, that found that 85% of your success in this world is about those people and soft skills. When you look at that, right, that instructor hat is that top 15, right, where you're the subject matter expert. You're teaching about this important topic. But what makes great educators is the 85% below that, right? It was when they have to become that coach, that mentor, when they have to relate to people, that's what makes the best educators. It's the same in every field, right? And you know that as well as anybody else. Obviously, you already hire for it. Right. Uh, here's, a, here's a good comment that they appreciate the do chores with, with your children, okay? They also say that this would be a great presentation at a parent-teacher association to provide within the school districts and, and this, this person really appreciates your suggestions today for how we can start to, to move this forward. Awesome. That's great. Okay. I'm looking to see if I have any other questions coming in here. I'm watching, I'm watching both the Q&A box and the, and the chat box. Okay. I don't see anything else com, coming up. Um, I'll just wait here another second or two. But while I'm doing that, uh, Josh, I want to thank you both personally and professionally for an outstanding presentation. I mean, there's education and there's entertainment, but I think we were edutained today. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm surprised somebody hadn't said, okay, I, I want whatever Josh is taking in his coffee because I, that five-hour energy <laughs> drink definitely paid off. Uh, uh, your passion, your enthusiasm for what you're doing, I think is important. It's that same passion and enthusiasm today that I think has to be passed from educators, from mentors, from, from coaches to the, those that are learning. And, and trust me when I say the class is not the classroom all the time. 
class is in session every day. The question is, where do you want a whole class to, to have that teachable moment with somebody, be it a soft skill, be it a technical skill, that moment's there. Do you recognize that at that instance and take that opportunity every chance you get? Because that 1% club is powerful. The chart says it alone. The question is, do you want to be a part of the 1% club today? I hope so. Another comment here that says, um, me too, me too. We, we are all the same, just a little different. Uh, another person here, uh, you obviously owe them card money because they say you're amazing and aspiring. Wow, th thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I've got a lot of checks I'm going to have to write after the session. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Well, Josh, once again, I want to thank you for a great presentation and thanks as well to our, our phenomenal sponsors. Without you, we would not have been able to, to do this. Okay. Uh, a reminder, particularly for those that like to, like I've got a comment here that says, I'd love to show this to, to my college freshman nephew to see this. Well, guess what? You're going to be able to do that, Miss Kimberly, because we're going to email this presentation, the rendering, and the charts to everyone that registered for this session today. Whether you were on the session or not, you're all going to get this at the end, at the end of the week. So, Kevin, it's like your Oprah. Please, well, I'm not giving away a card, Dave. I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry. You get a presentation. You get a presentation. You get a presentation. That 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 that's right. No, and, and that's that's the that's the great thing about about a virtual SETI in, in that we all get to share the ideas and, and you'll be able to refer back to these teaching moments by going back to the to the to the the send that we sent. The other thing I'll tell you is that we're getting ready uh, to Everyone that attends a session, okay, will get a certificate of participation. This is a beautiful certificate that you'll want to hang on your love me wall, okay, right next to the, 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 you know, the grandma's favorite cookie recipe that nobody gets shared, okay. They all get the cookie at, at Christmas, but nobody gets a recipe right up there on your love me wall that you'll be able to share that with everybody. So, Josh, once again... Fabulous presentation. Uh, I think it's been one of our very best of the week and, and hope that you all continue to join us this week. Our next presentation is at one o'clock this afternoon, Strategies for Networking to Develop Community Partnerships by Lori Weston and Brandy Bragg uh, from Pitt Community College and Region Q Workforce Development Board. Some great ideas that you'll, that you'll see, see there. You all have a fantastic rest of your day, and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody out there, and thank you for the work that you're doing. It is so critical. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Josh. Take care, my friend. You're welcome, everybody.